This is the 20th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, Pro, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live where we are going to talk about fishing wrapping up post classic week with a BTL regular. I uh, do want to remind everybody tonight 6:30 p.m. special edition day 4 with the man Frank Scalish. Frank has made it back from the Classic Expo in one piece, which I gave him about a 50/50 chance to do that, but he has made it home and we are going to go live for a special edition Wednesday evening edition of btl with all things frank scalish and you know i was walking around the classic expo last week uh, and our guest today stopped me and he said boy he said uh he said what what are you wearing he said that is the sharpest apparel that i have seen at the classic expo and i said why i said that's the new btl merch that just dropped uh on basszone.com under the shop btl tab and he said that looks like some really high quality cotton and i said it is i said we actually spent a little bit more to get it and he said what all do you have in the line and I said, there's hoodies, there's T-shirts, there's hats. And that person who asked me about it would be none other than Matt Stefan. Matt, thanks for jumping on BTL today. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for having me on today, Matt. The uh, That is basically how the conversation went. But I think I added at the end how good you make everything look. It doesn't have to be high quality for you to make it look stylish. It is. And then you said that you were going to order some. And I said, but you better hurry because the store is only open for 14 days. Yeah, you, you, know, you may not even have known this, but I was wearing my BTL St. Jude shirt on day three of the classic. It was just under my jersey. Really? That's cool. No, I know that you did that. Uh, that there'll be more information about the T-shirt that's coming. That should drop. Uh, that should drop next week. We're not going to have this. We're going to basically do two different drops for that. But uh, but yeah, I so there's that. the there's the the hard sell product drop merch, but I'm proud of it. I worked on it for. A long time with the people at ATS printing and then they were like well how many do you want to order and I was like can we do that thing last time where we like opened up the store for a select amount of time and then so limited limited drop all of Frank's stuff is in there too all of the uh all of the uh hand-drawn bass here one second let me see if I can pull it up so what you're, you're saying we should buy it now and then like in a year it'll be a collectible and we can sell it for double on eBay that's um, what you're saying that's a that's a possibility. Here it is right there. There it is. The BTL merch store shop uh BTL under the shop BTL tab on basszone.com. But seriously though, look at the look at Frank's shirt. Like if you click on it, so that's the back. So he drew that shirt and then it has the signature on it and then the front has uh has BTL. I'm sure we'll talk about it tonight since Frank gets most of those proceeds. He's he's like, "Can we talk about the merch?" And I was like, "Absolutely." <laughs> So, uh, back from the classic, we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, I've got a little bit of a, I don't even want to say a rant. I want to say that it is more of a, uh, suggestion for the folks at Bass. And I've already talked to Chase Anderson about this face to face. I've talked to Ronnie Moore about this face to face. I have brought this up to Bass and it's all positive. And we're going to dive into the Bassmaster celebrity program pro am. Technically, it was the Bassmaster Classic, so, uh, Bassmaster Classic Progressive Celebrity Pro Am Tournament presented by Bass Pro Shops. That's when a, was it? A, it was the day before the Classic, so we're going to dive into that, and I need your thoughts and opinions on that too. We're also going to talk about the Touring Anglers Association tournament that is going on at uh, Lake Lanier. Next weekend, like I believe the weekend or the week after uh, Easter, no live scope, no 360. I did get uh, an email about that, that they they didn't have the numbers that they were hoping. It was a $300,000 payout, 200 anglers, uh, and it looks like they'll be up around 60 boats, but they're going off. that, that That's going to go off uh, on Lake Lanier, and we'll talk a little bit about that. 
Also want to get your experience as a vendor uh, with Core Tackle at the Bassmaster Classic. And did I hear that correctly, Matt, that this was your first Bassmaster Classic that you've ever attended? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, in hindsight, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that. Like, I always had the stance of I didn't want to go to the Classic until I got to fish in the Classic. And then we started Core Tackle and... Everyone was like, if you're going to do any show, you got to do the classic. Like, that's the show to do. So we decided to get a boot there. <clears throat> and uh, in hindsight, I'm embarrassed to say that that was my first classic because of because of the like how important it is for our industry. Like, I never truly recognized that. I always thought it was kind of another show, another event. I, I don't know how many Forest Woods, Forest Wood Cups I've fished and championships I've fished, but uh, I haven't seen anything compare I mean, there is nothing that comes close to uh, that event as a whole. So, you know, I I think in the future, uh, you know, I've already told my wife and boys that we're probably going next year in Dallas. And uh, whether that means we have a booth, I don't know about that. Like, I've got I've got mixed opinions from a vendor standpoint, but from a uh, fan of the sport and from a career standpoint, like, I think it's very important for me to be doing that stuff. Well, let's dive into that. We've done a full week of shows with BTLs starting basically a week before a classic to the week after the classic. Guys who have fished in it, guys who have attended it, pundits, people behind the scenes, people at the expo. And then uh, on Monday, we had the champ, Justin Hamner, who led wire to wire to win it with a little over 58 pounds. He was on from the Bass Tank headquarters. Um, but let's dive into the vendor portion of it because I know that that is very important Everybody, there's a lot of people who go to the Bassmaster Classic Expo and don't even go to the weigh-in. But are you comfortable talking about what it takes to go from, hey, I'm Matt Stefan, I'm up in Wisconsin, I'm, a, I'm a, a one of the owners of Core Tackle, let's get a booth, let's sell product there, let's get everything, let's get everyone down there. Are you comfortable kind of talking about what that process entails? Because I think we just show up and voila everyone's there and everyone's happy and you you Not can quite. buy the new swim jigs and the tush hooks and all of that stuff. But w I'm curious, cause I don't know what goes into getting to the classic to when the doors opened on noon on Friday. Yeah, man, it is not an easy process. It is uh there's a lot of behind the scenes paperwork. There's a lot of planning. It's not something you just start doing like the first couple of days or the, you know, the week ahead of time, but we've been, Man, we've been working on this probably for six months, uh, you know, being that we are a new company. This was the first show we've done. There were some things that we as a company had to do that probably a lot of other vendors didn't have to do. So for us, I mean, we had to do everything from design a booth, uh, which entails backdrops, tablecloths, figuring out how you're going to display products. So there's a lot that goes into that. But then it was uh, just in terms of getting the booth, you're also talking about having to make sure you've got all of your correct sales tax things set up all the different paperwork and uh you know again i haven't done a lot of shows recently from a vendor standpoint i did used to do a bunch of vendor shows that i help people with uh you you know 10 15 20 years ago smaller local stuff and from that standpoint i don't recall ever seeing the type of paperwork and like insurance requirements that the bassmaster classic required so from that same point you know it's probably a good thing we had it all but it was just more hurdles that we had to go through even to the point right now where i'm battle not battling but one of the things that this show specifically required was to have certain sales tax uh forms filled out that are separate from the sales tax you would just like the quarterly or monthly payments that we mm -hmm. do through our sales tax programs for like online sales in this case, I'm actually in the process right now of doing some tax paperwork uh, as a special event. That's just going to create more headaches because now I got to I got to pull out just the sales from this event, file that stuff separately. And then when I go to file my uh, state tax, state sales tax with Oklahoma, which we do. I don't know off the top of my head if they're a monthly or quarterly because every state is different, but I'm going to have to re-pull that out and then file separately to take that stuff out to keep from double paying. It's just, a, it's more of a hassle. So, and that's all the vendor side. Like that's yeah. not necessary. Like everyone's got to deal with that. But I do think that that's a, that was specific more to Oklahoma. So based on the location that Bass chose. Um, 
but you know, so that that's the paperwork side of things. In terms of getting everything ready, I mean, we were making, we had to make special uh, product orders to make sure we had a bunch of product on hand. So you know, we have a pretty good. I, I say pretty good. We try to do our best in terms of inventory ordering to make sure we've got so much moving out for future months to make sure we don't go short. And when you throw a, an event like the classic in, you need to make special purchases based on that. So we, we were product heavy based on a lot of the other vendors I've talked to uh, who have had boots in the past or people that have gone, you know, they basically were describing, you know, the traffic flow as being elbows to, Mm -hmm. blank walls and uh you know from that standpoint you know it, we were told to bring every piece of product we could bring because we would sell it and that that was not that did not happen i mean we had a i i feel like we had an okay show we basically mm -hmm. broke even uh which in hindsight i think wasn't too bad you know we were in the area we were at we were one of the much more consistent flow boots. Like I would actually, yeah. I was actually surprised at how good we were selling based on the number of people coming through. You know, I kind of felt like it was one out of four people that walked by our booth, bought something from us, which I, Oh, wow. That's incredible. Which I felt really good about like we had yeah. other vendors coming up to us saying, Hey, we love having you here. Cause we're creating a traffic jam and you know, things that are good from a, a vendor standpoint. So I'm not disappointed with how we sold. I am disappointed with the traffic flow as a whole. Now, the show was busy for certain periods of time. You know, there was a window, uh, your your lunch hour window, where I felt like the show was busy. It wasn't so busy you ever had to wait for traffic to move. But, I mean, there were a lot of people there. The reality of it is, as soon as the weigh-in starts, which is like, uh, well, it was five o'clock, but at around four o'clock, everyone would leave the expo, go to the uh, the way in. And at that point, it get pretty slow. The other thing is the the first hour of the show was pretty slow, too. So you'd have, you know, you had your main entrances. And then the way the layout of this expo was, there were like six or seven different rooms. And some of the rooms, uh, if you were a smaller vendor like myself, I feel like we mm -hmm. were more in some of the wing rooms so it would take a while for a lot of the traffic to even get to you I so from you. that standpoint, we had big lulls in the beginning big lulls at the end so our selling period was really like a three-hour window in the middle part of the day so based on that i mean i'm pretty happy with how it went the reality of it is the booth uh is several thousand dollars the we had uh several people there to help us so we paid them we paid, you know, room and board, lodging, food, uh, you know, by the end of the week, it probably cost us, I mean, it probably cost us close to $10,000 to have the booth. So from that standpoint, you're talking about selling a lot of jigs to just recoup that because, you know, every jig you sell isn't necessarily profit, right? You got to take your cost mm -hmm. of goods sold out there too. So it, uh, from that standpoint, you know, in hindsight, I wouldn't do the classic again with the idea that we're going to go to make a boatload of money. I would do it again to build product recognition, to build the mm -hmm. brand uh, recognition, to meet new customers. We met a lot of the buyers that we've been working with. We've met a bunch of other retailers. Like So from that standpoint, there every everyone in the industry is at the Bassmaster Classic. So from a connection standpoint, I'm sure it'll you know, it, it was very good for us to be at. Uh, I don't know, you know, I could, I think I could probably accomplish a lot of that without even having the booth, but, um, you know, from, so from a vendor standpoint, a little bit different, a couple of things I really didn't like, you know, the day we got there and I'm just kind of rambling, Matt, cut me off at any point if you want. That's, that's kind of what the uh, show is based on. The, uh, so we got there Thursday to set up and, you know, you're in downtown Tulsa, so there's not really any good parking. So I pull into the parking garage that's connected and it was 10 bucks to park. And I was like, well, that's not great, but we're in, you know, it's city life. We're, we're going to pay for it. So we set up, do everything. The next day we come back and the same parking garage was now $30 to park in. So mm -hmm. all weekend long, you know, they ramped up parking on us and that, you know, having multiple people come in, you know, we carpooled, but we're still paying, you know, for a couple of cars a day to be parked there. I mean, that's a couple hundred dollars in just parking. 
And then, you know, the same thing kind of happened with Wi-Fi. You know, the Wi-Fi, they charge this $900 to have Wi-Fi for the booth. Good Lord. Yeah. And that's so we can. We oh, can Jeffries would have had an absolute meltdown. Well, well, here's the kicker, Matt. We the Wi-Fi didn't even function for the for three quarters of the first day of the show. So, you know, we needed to get a, did you get a discount. Uh, we, well, I'm talking with them right now, but as far as I know, we're not going to get a discount at this point. Uh, but yeah, so the, and that wasn't just us. That was the entire, That's the whole entire show, the entire show. Anybody who want to take credit card payments, if they were using, it was, well, we go through Shopify, whoever the other, there's one other main player, neither of them were able to do it. So, I mean, for us, then that meant we sent one of, uh, you know, our people out to buy a square credit card thing that you could plug into your phone and that worked, but then we're paying for that. And there's more fees associated with that. So there were some things I did not like the, the floor layout was, was another one that I think, and I don't know that, you know, Bassmaster can do anything about that, but you know, there were a lot of little rooms. There were a lot of people that were like, Oh, I didn't know there was an upstairs. I didn't mm -hmm. know there was, you know, another room off of this other wing. So I think there were a lot of people that missed stuff at the show too, based on that. Did you get a chance to to stroll around the show at all, or were you kind of tethered to the booth? Now I know that you're working with Johnny Schultz, who who was maybe in the booth for 15 minutes <laughs> each day. tried tried to play the yeah. tried to play the uh, you know doing some work, spreading around the show, and you guys literally had to tether him to the to the core tackle in the deep dive booth on the final day. Yeah, that didn't even work. He chewed his way through that rope. That rope. Uh, yeah, it, you know, I I was at the booth most of the entire show. I had a couple sponsor obligations that I went, and I so I was working other mm -hmm. sponsor booths. Uh, but other than that, I really only saw what I was seeing on my way from our booth to those sponsor booths. I really, I really wanted to be in the booth to say hi to the people that were buying our products, and <clears throat> I kind of feel like from a you know, a selling standpoint and answering questions standpoint, I'm, I'm probably as one, you know, one of the bait designers, the best mm -hmm. to be able to answer those questions, uh, which worked out fine. I mean, John, Johnny's a butterfly anyways. I mean, he just, I, he just gets in that environment and he can't sit still. He wants to meet everybody and see everybody. And for him, you know, it was good for him to get out there and, uh, you know, talk to a bunch of people. And ultimately, I mean, I think that's one, I think that's one reason we're such a good team. I, uh, I'm, I'm much more like hands-on looking at the product type thing. And Johnny's got a much bigger picture for the company and, uh, both of us work really well with that. Uh, one of the things that I thought was, was one of the highlights was, uh, you invited, uh, Courtney and myself to a little bowling one of the <laughs> evenings. And, you know, I felt I felt some pressure just because if you're a BTL listener, you know, Mark Jeffries bowling, big part of his life. Third person to ever bowl a 300 game, both left and right handed uh, three year professional bowling tour, uh, you know, league member, which is the elite series, you know, of bowling and uh, 13 perfect games, I believe, under his belt and the head coach of Southern Nazarene University bowling. So we come into this bowling and, and I, it was a lot of people on one lane, seven, but it was yourself. It was current BPT angler of the year, Matt Becker. It was the hottest young angler on tour right now in uh, <laughs> Drew Gill. It was uh, YouTube sensation and content creator Jimmy Easterling, who I had met a number uh, yourself, a number Johnny Schultz. So it was a pretty packed deal. Uh, and, and I'm just happy that I was able to walk away with that victory. It was almost a victory by default, though, as I was the only one out of all seven to break 100. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I would be so proud of that. I mean, I what was, I think it was 110, 113. Uh, I, I think it was 112. And the only reason you were able to muster that out is because you finished the 10th frame with what, a strike and a spare or a spare? A strike, a strike and a spare. I started strong and I finished strong. I did have six yeah. open frames in the middle, but, uh, you know, anytime you can get a W against some of those names, uh, I'll take that. And I, I took, you know, I take the pride, keep it in Oklahoma. I called Jeffries. I sent him a picture of the strike that closed the deal. And I said, hey. I said, hey, I'm representing here. And he said, well, what'd you shoot? And I said, 112. And all he said was, wow. <laughs> In a not a good way. In not a good way. I uh, I mean, I honestly, Matt, I'm a little disappointed in you <clears throat> and your bowling skills based on having the ability to have been 
tutored by such a well-rounded bowler and Mark. Well, like, Jeffries where, what is happened? not. How are you not better? Because I have never gotten a single lesson from Mark Jeffries. I've bowled with him twice in 14 years. That, twice. that amazes me. Why only twice? Like, I, uh, I thought you were going to One time was with the least. Bass Fishing Hall of Fame uh, auction winner, and we had a great time, and I was absolutely on fire. I bowled like a 200 my first game and then backed it off to like 150. And then the other time was at like a, one of the fishing events. But, I mean, he's always practicing. He's always doing his thing, so he just never has, has taught me anything. Now, you could move the ball a little bit. Uh, sometimes, oh, yeah. you know, you'd move it from <laughs> well, my, the middle yeah, to my... the gutter, but sometimes it looked amazing. I mean, I really feel like bowling is not about knocking the number of pins down. It's about how well you can hook the ball. So, like, to <laughs> me, a good ball is actually one that rides the right gutter as a right-hander. One that, when I say rides, I'm talking it wants to go in the gutter. But you yeah. got such rotational spin on it that it, like, just pops back out. And then because it grabs at that point, it just completely hooks hard left and gets the left gutter before you even get to the pins. Like to me, that's a good ball. Like that's impressive. I could put the ball down and knock pins down. That's not a big deal. But who else can spin? I didn't see anyone else spin that ball from right to left like I could. Regardless of the results, though, you're going to do it the way you think that it should Heck be yeah. done based on the way Heck it's yeah. always been done and not on what actually garners the best results at the given time. Yeah, I'm not I'm not impressed with number of pins knocked down. It's rotational spin. OK, uh, speaking of which, let's talk about this no forward facing sonar tournament that's going well, you, on, on. It's a good it's a good lead in because I, I truly believe that's why Drew Gill is so bad at bowling. He couldn't use the live scope on that. Uh, listen, that was the first time I'd met Drew Gill. First of all, I didn't know that in order to be associated with your whole crew, you had to be at least six, four. Like that's a <laughs> minimum. Like I was by far the shortest person there. I think what, how tall is Jimmy Easterling? Like six, two. Uh, yeah, is he I mean, my he, height? He's six a, foot? Uh, he's a six footer. I think for sure there I was, I'm, I'm a legit six foot. And I was by far the shortest person out of everybody in that group. Like it, like Matt Becker's what six five, six four. I mean, it depends who you talk to, but yeah, he's probably a six four. You're six five. I'm six four. Drew Gill six four. Yeah, he's up there. He's he does not look that big in his videos, but then you that's because he's always hunched over. When you watch oh, him on TV, he's always hunched over. But yeah, when you get yeah. him in person, you're like, yeah, man, you're pretty tall. Uh. Johnny's six two. Nah, I mean Johnny. I'll give Johnny with a the solid. hair, with the new haircut. He's oh six yeah, two. with the hair, he might be six six. He's he was really gelling it up for the show. He was on fire. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was quite quite an impressive array of uh, <laughs> of tall individuals there. But anyway, Dude, it, let's that move was on. A, that was a fun that was a fun night. I have no complaints about that event. That it is night. it just as far as like a marketing and a network and things though, like. It, like you said at the beginning, I mean, there's a lot that goes on at the Bassmaster Classic that then is followed up on at ICAST or because it's kind of you have that time in between that and ICAST. ICAST is a lot of meetings, a lot of vendor meetings. There's just a little bit different vibe at the Classic as far as kind of the hanging out, the excitement around it with the Expo. Basically, all the same people that are at the Classic at the Expo, except maybe even more at the Classic. Yeah, it, it, it's a great event. Anybody that has not gone to it, don't don't do what I did. Don't wait for too long because it is it is a uh, it's a celebration of the sport. That's really how I felt about it. Like, I mean, I can tell you working my booth. It was unbelievable to me how many familiar faces came by my booth, everything from neighbors down the road, 14 hours away to co-anglers I fished with at the U.S. Open in, you know, Nevada like everybody is there and and they're there because we love the sport of bass fishing so like the the mood was extremely positive like it was a great event like i said i'll be i'll be going back i'm disappointed that i didn't take the kids to mm -hmm. this one i just didn't i didn't want to go to my first classic and it was not also a work go. trip yeah exactly i didn't know how i would be able to keep them contained in the booth in hindsight i think hank would have sold a pile of jigs for us had he been there but <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, it would have been hard to keep them like they're, they, you know, they would have been at every autograph signing. They would have been like everywhere. So it would have been hard to keep them there, but 
I, I mean, the like, I know a lot of people think, you know, because I fished the BPT that I'd want to knock the classic and, you know, it's, it was an amazing event. Like that's all I can say. And I didn't even get to do and see most of it. I can't even imagine as an angler, what that would, what that would feel like to fish that. All right, we're going to take our first break of the show and we come back with Matt Steffen. Uh, we're going to talk about the Touring Anglers Association No FFS tournament that is uh, taking place this week at Lake Lanier. And then we're also going to talk about the Bassmaster Celebrity Pro-Am that took place before the Classic. And and I'm going to... Uh, is that is the word opine? I'm going to opine. Is that the is that the a, a shorter way to say give my opinion on? I mean, like, have you ever heard that? Like, I'm going to opine on the event and then get your feedback. Yeah, I've never used that verbiage, but I mean, it the way you described it makes it sound like okay. I it sounds more like a jump, a lumberjack term. Like, I'm going to opine that tree, I'm gonna cut the top off of it, or something. Sounds a little dirty, too, but (laughs) (laughs) watch me go go. Go opine this tree. (laughs) All right, it's BTL on a Wednesday with Matt Steffen. We'll be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96-inch wide-body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry-leading design coupled with tournament-winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Gamakatsu. The innovation leader in fish hooks is launching Nano Alpha technology in 2024. Nano Alpha is a new finish available on Gamakatsu's most popular hook styles. It delivers two times slicker performance, four times better corrosion resistance. Nano Alpha technology makes the world's greatest fish hooks even better in 2024 to help anglers catch more fish. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing. From household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. Everything you need, one legendary brand. Time to move on. Strike King. All right, welcome back, BTL on a Wednesday. Don't forget tonight, 6.30 p.m. Central Time, Wednesday, March 27th, uh, Frank Scalish live. And then if you listen on Thursday, you can also just listen to the replay on Thursday. And then Guide Day returns on Friday uh, with a special edition. Casey Scanlon talking about guiding on Lake of the Ozarks for largemouth for spots on one of the busiest fisheries, busiest lakes Busiest lake slash productive fishery in the country. Fair, fair statement on Lake of the Ozarks describing it as that, Matt Stefan. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's got everything. That's a crazy fishery. Boat traffic wise, fishery. It's, it's a great fishery, but you got to put up with the boats on a, on a nice weekend day. That's for sure. 
so I received an email and I talked to a couple people about this. I've talked to some people who are involved with it. I've just talked to some people who are fans of it. But this kind of made some waves when it was announced the Touring Anglers Association, no forward facing sonar, basically no practice, no forward facing sonar, just show up and fish on Lake Lanier. I think what is the entry? Is the entry fee five thousand dollars for this? Yeah. Five thousand dollars for it. They're trying to uh attract both local sticks, people who want to do high dollar tournaments without the forward facing sonar and uh MLF anglers at all levels and bassmaster anglers at all levels from the BPT and the leets all the way down to the BFLs and the Bass Nation. And like I said before the show, I received an email. I don't know how much of this is out there, so I won't say his name on that, but thanks for filling me in on it. Uh, but I'm hearing names in this, and I don't know if this is 100% correct, but, you know, John Cox, Hank Cherry, Brandon Polinick, Andy Morgan, Joey Safuentes, Emil Wagner, Paul Marks, Trent Palmer. Uh, and these are some of the 60 boats that will be competing on this. What do you know about this derby, Matt? Well, I, I don't know anything more than what they've put out there. I've definitely uh, watched some of their video releases to talk about changes and how they're going to implement things. And I, I've been very impressed with what they, they're they doing. I think, uh, I mean, I think the concept is great. I think finding the number of guys that are going to fish a $5,000 tournament is more difficult than what a lot of people would assume. Mm -hmm. uh especially if you start limiting tools that they can use you know i think there's a lot of anglers out there that are so comfortable with forward facing sonar that if you take that away they're not going to fish it so i think you limit the number of anglers even more from that standpoint uh, you know ultimately as an angler as an uh, you know as an addict i wish i was fishing the event like that sounds like an event that not only is on one of my favorite lakes to fish in lake lanier just from a, a fun standpoint uh it's a body of water that you can fish shallow and deep you know it's a it's going to be a, a it's going to be a fishery that shows out for the guys that are fishing it and the fact that their payouts at least on a i think wasn't it three was it 200 boats they were trying to get is that uh, what the original was, number was yeah it was a one it's a 100 percent payout but then underneath yeah. it it says minus a few expenses whatever that means but yeah <laughs> but, then, well, when, but I mean, regardless when you look at the payouts i mean the yeah, payouts so based on are, 50 boats which is kind of what it basically sounds like it's going to be based on this email that i received between 40 and 60 boats so first place is 80 12th place is 10 000. so 12 out of 50 boats gets I mean, 10 that grand basically, that's basically paying out as good as a championship level event a hundred well uh or or better than a championship yeah. level event depending on yeah. which championship level event you're fishing there matt but uh if you talk about a local tournament like if you're fishing a nickels or you're fishing a skeeter or you're fishing uh any of these major team tournament trails that you're talking a 500 to a thousand dollar entry fee you have to finish like top to clear five that not clear but to earn five thousand dollars if you're getting ten thousand for 12 and you're in Five thousand. Let's just take expenses out to get five thousand profit on your entry fee. You have to finish either first or second or third in every yeah. single one of these three hundred plus boat tournaments, and this is based on a fifty boat. But you're also five grand in if you go out and it doesn't work work out for you. Listen to some of these rules. This is I've never heard anything like this. This is wild, Matt. So. And like I said, I do not know a ton about this. I just got the email. I'm on the website. I'm kind of learning it. I have no affiliation with them, no association with them. I just think it's a it's it's interesting that this is happening and they're not only just testing it, they're going big yeah. right off the hopper. So the no information rule period, 15 days off limits to all contestants to police the no information rule and to try to stop the buying of information. All anglers gps units will be restricted to only waypoints created during the ride around and tournament days this will be strictly enforced and reviewed by tournament staff so let's say they had it on grand and i've got all my waypoints from grand even without forward facing sonar i would have to wipe my unit on grand and start my practice drive-through because there is no practice. Basically, you get a drive-through and turn a bits 
completely off. Like I, I'd have zero waypoints on the unit when I started that practice. Mm -hmm. So actually, like if you're I'm, on a Lanier, okay if you're on a Hartwell, if you're on anything, yeah. like you start that, obviously, you know, in your head, like some stuff, but it's not like you can run 500 cane piles on the first cast or yeah. 80 brush piles. Like you're having to go back and refine and do all that stuff on the fly. It, it definitely, well, it does a couple of things. And first off, most, I would be willing to bet you the majority of touring pros wipe their unit clean before each event anyways. We've got everything, you know, saved and your units run so much faster if you don't have 10,000 waypoints on it. So like for me, I, my way, my unit will be clean for the next event. Now, if I had waypoints already for Dale Hollow, I would have those loaded up into it. But in this case, it's like I just can't upload anything. So I, I'm, I think that's that sounds really bad. Like you got to erase all your waypoints. Well, the reality is you save it to a card and then save them back. You load them back up after. No, so I know, but like for this tournament, you can't have it. So let's say hypothetically yeah. they had one on Hartwell. Yeah, I like Hartwell a lot. I have no issue fishing without forward facing sonar on Hartwell. But, you know, when I heard that, that I would be like, yeah, I, I would do that. That would be awesome. You wouldn't know what's on the cane. You wouldn't know what's on the brush pile. You'd have to fish it. But now I'm like, why would I drop five grand on that? Because I've been there twice. I've marked a ton of cane, but I don't know it well enough to like run back to it and check it. So I'm not going to dump five grand into it because I know that every single local that's there or anything can can do a milk run in their head without a way. Yeah. It it's one of those things where I do think it it does give some advantage to the locals who probably can go out there and remark everything. You know, they, if they know exactly where to find the brush piles, mm -hmm. they can go out there and remark them pretty quick. Uh, but at the same time, they still need to go out there and remark it. And if that's what they want to spend their time doing, they can do that. I, you know, I I guess I just appreciate the idea of trying to create a fully level playing field which is what i feel like they're doing you know what mm -hmm. regardless of forward facing sonar or not i just like the fact that they're saying you know you need to wipe all that information off and we're only really going to go out what's the the ride around's only a couple hours so isn't it? instead of a practice round there was a three to four hour ride around on the lake on monday before the tournament but during the yeah. ride around no fishing is allowed yeah so, I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like, I mean, it's basically saying, okay, guys, you're going to go out there and, mm -hmm. you know, try to almost wing it. And, it, and so there's part of me, it's like the first that gives huge advantage to the guys that are able to figure it out first versus like somebody like myself. I feel like I'm always figuring stuff out on the third day of practice for me. And a lot of that's because right. I'm taking all these little things from all over the place. And then I'm really refining it based on my last day of practice. So it would it would probably not be a great thing for me from a you know a fishing standpoint but i love the idea of like okay i, I like the the old classics where people got on a plane and they took you someplace like to me mm -hmm. that's an exciting way to fish cuz you're really seeing who can fish you know who who who's relying on their skills and not other information or you know whatever else is out there so the full field fishes first two days, then they cut to the top 12 for the final day. Um, equipment restrictions, the following equipment. This is another thing that would keep me from fishing it. The following equipment must be removed. Look, it says it right there in all capital letters removed from the boat before the ride around and endorsed by tournament staffs item removed include live scope forward facing sonar and 360 imaging transducer dude once my live scope is dialed in and mounted i ain't taking that thing off like i i mean i'm with the bass tank and stuff but like to actually yeah. remove that is dude i i just i just got a new mount for the transducer graph and i've been so happy with how my active target has looked this year i don't even want to put it onto the new mount to hold it because i'm like exactly once you get so used to something once but, it's dialed in you can't you don't move yeah. that like that's your baby but i did i, know that, I think that's I, nitpicking I, on this stuff I think, but i'm just well, saying I think, they my... changed, I think they changed that recently i thought i saw a video that said that they were not going to make you remove it what they were going to do is have you unplug it and then on the end of the plug, they were going to put like a, like a tag, like a tamper, and, a tamper yeah, seal a tamper resistant proof, thing to make yeah. sure and if that was re like, and it would be numbered. And if it was removed or tampered with, you'd be DQ'd. Okay. 
which would be a good way to do it assume you know assuming that whatever they're using can't actually be removed or copied and put put back on but i like the idea of that because I, I mean i'm the I'm the same way, dude, to remove that stuff. Like if you, if they made you take the black box and everything out, it would be an absolute pain in the butt. Yeah. Not happening. So it's interesting. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be very interested to watch and see how it goes. I think there's a lot of people that are probably going to be watching this tournament to see how it goes. Uh, I'm and I'm surprised it, they're doing it with 60 guys. I thought they were pretty clear in the beginning that they wouldn't do it if they weren't close to that 200 number. Yeah, I think it's an uphill climb because, like, I know how good those guys are on Grand. I know a lot of the guys who put the brush piles out that Justin Hamner won on. Uh, I've competed against a lot of guys that I would want absolutely nothing to do with for $5,000 and no forward-facing Sodar, and no waypoints on my unit. Not that that's a crutch for yeah. me, but it's the tournament in their minds. They know what the brush is like because they put it there. They know exactly where each one yeah. is, and they beat you eight out of ten times anyway. I mean, I kind, day of feel, I kind of feel like this tournament could just be a donation to Emil Wagner. Like he's, 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 I mean, in my opinion, he's the best on that lake. So I, I would be surprised to see him not do quite well in this. Yeah. He's going to win. Sorry. Phoenix is saying, I keep talking over you. That's like my one bad thing that I do on BTL is no, I'm actually, I keep cutting you off. That's my bad. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not you. It's me. Yeah. That's my one consistent gripe or, or, or uh, constructive criticism for BTO is I get fired up and then I just talk. Hey, I do want to, I do want to tell you uh, a sidetrack because we always talk a little bit about gas stations. I yeah. took after Redcrest, I took, uh, so I had Sarah and the two boys with me. So we stopped at the one just North of Birmingham uh on the way home and it it was like the boys were at a uh, amusement park it tacked on a, almost an hour onto my trip and they loved it they got their picture taken with bucky and they they thought it was uh the best the best thing in the world i thought it was pretty nice it, it didn't change it yeah he get, yeah bucky gave him a high five and a sticker it did not change my opinion uh, on the quick trip still being the best gas station in the world because it's a true gas station and not a destination of whatever Bucky is. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. Can I show your kids on this show? I didn't mean to. I was oh, just yeah, I never on, thought about they're that. On Sometimes my, you they're know. on my channel all the time. Okay, well, when you're a celebrity, I didn't know. Yeah. No, they. Uh, those are two big smiles. The, after we stopped there, they wanted to know how many more Bucky's we could stop at on the way home. And luckily, the answer was zero. There were no no more Bucky's. What was the thing of the favorite item that they per that you guys purchased? Oh man, we came out of there. Well, Duke Duke had like a a lanyard, like one of those retractable lanyards that he absolutely loves to have. Uh, he got a Bucky, I guess, stuffed animal, a little one. Hank picked a blanket because for the car ride home, he said it, he was going to be cold and needed a blanket. And that blank, that blanket actually got me again at the classic. Cause you know, that was only three days before I had to leave for the classic. I got to the classic and grabbed my core tackle hat to put it on to wear, <laughs> to wear at the booth. Yeah. And it was full of black Bucky's blanket fuzzies. So it took me 15 minutes to clean off the fuzzies. So Definitely not super impressed with the quality of the blanket, I guess, but it, it actually came in pretty handy. The kids, it was big enough. The kids shared it on the way home and, uh, you know, took naps, which anytime you're driving, I'm, I'm all for that. Did you get, you got the buck, the nuggets though, the beaver nuggets. No, we didn't get beaver nuggets. Did we got, no, we didn't get those. Is that, is that what you're supposed to get? Well, that's the signature item, just like the ribeye steak is the quick trip signature item. Bucky's we beaver probably, nuggets. We probably had them in our hands, and Sarah picked it up and looked at the nutrition label and went, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I 
yeah, I, I, I grabbed some. I grabbed some of the potato chips, like they had fresh potato chips, and I, I, we didn't look at it until we were in the car, and Sarah looked at them. She's like, "How is all this garbage in potato chips?" She was not happy I was eating those. Let's put a bow on the no forward facing sonar. Listen, uh, like I said, not. I'm just talking about it as I learn about it on the show. I'm intrigued with it. I'm not a, opposed to fishing it. Quite frankly, the five thousand dollar entry fee is not uh, it, like maybe not in my budget. Like with eighteen hundred dollars for nine opens this year, but I'm interested. I will be following it, and I commend them for what this. TAA has done in offering this and seeing what the interest is in it at a high stakes level. How's that sound? Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I want to see where it goes. You know, I, you know, if there was one up here in my neck of the woods, I'd probably jump in and fish it. But the, the, I'm, I'm curious to see how they're going to do if they're just making one off tournaments here and there. Like I, I tend to think that the majority of professional level anglers would like to fish a high dollar series knowing that there's some end of the year championship you know that there's that there's some sort of point system because if you have a bad tournament it's not just throwing money away it's you can still make that up and and kind of recover it in the future mm -hmm. what else oh okay let's talk about the celebrity pro-am then so you didn't even know about this tournament did you no, you know, when you when you said Travis Pastrana, I saw a flipping through social media. I did see some form of post that he made talking about Scott Martin. So that, but I don't yeah, he I fished didn't, with Scott I didn't Martin. Know, well, I didn't know that that was because there was a actual tournament going on. So what what it was celebrities with. Uh, <laughs> did you see what Sarah's watching? Apparently, she said the fudge was no good. We literally threw out most of the fudge. Which was well, disappointing. Bucky's, Bucky's yeah. is more known for their brisket and meats and not their fudges. I mean, they tout and that Wally's big, is known for their popcorn. They tout that they've got a big fudge thing. I was unimpressed. What was wrong? Anyways, with you? so I, my question with respect to what the was wrong with the fudge, Matt? Like what made I it mean, inedible? Fudge is not supposed to be grainy and rubbery. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to melt in your mouth, and the sugar is supposed to be fully dissolved. And it was. And it was. The flavors were also not good. It was. I, I was. I was unimpressed. I wouldn't necessarily call myself a fudge connoisseur, but I was. I was unimpressed. Nobody in the car really liked it. Hmm. We're uh, gonna do. We're gonna do one together. We actually were going to do like a recap of like the Force, uh, Forcewood Red Crest and kind of classic type breakdown. That was one thing that was very clear to me, Matt, at the at the classic was how many people would rather watch my wife on the channel versus me. And and the oh, two she boys asked too. the tough questions. She uh, yeah, she makes me squirm a little bit. That's right. So this was an event that took place the day before the Classic. It was, like I said, the 2024 Bassmaster Classic Progressive Celebrity Pro-Am Tournament presented by Bass Pro Shops. And they fished on Skytook. And the way that it basically worked, just as a quick rundown, is it was a length tournament. The celebrity had to catch the first fish before the pro could fish and then they each were able to catch two fish and put them on the board uh logan parks did it seth fighter john soka chris saldane uh jamie hartman that's five of them that i can remember off the top of my it head was, it was elite series anglers yes it was elite series anglers okay. it was a four-hour tournament on there but here's the celebrities that were involved randy moss uh, Ross Chastain, NASCAR Cup Series driver, Travis Pastrana from Nitro Circus. I mean, that dude's a legend. Uh, Brian Robinson, we've had him on the show before. He yep. he's a, heavily into the industry uh, from the Vikings. Athletic. Yeah, C uh, Cody Cannon, same thing with that. He's he's also owns part of the uh, company, I think, in the industry too. Uh, he's with Whiskey Myers, Co Wetzel. Uh, hood fish entertainment social media influencer i've been a big fan of him because he catches a lot of sheep's head off the piers in florida which is my favorite way and then uh sydney wells from barstool outdoors 
So that's a mm-hmm. there's there's some big names in there. A lot of social media influence. And well, I wanted to follow this because I wanted to watch Scott Martin and Travis Pastrana fish. Uh, and they did some stuff at media day for it, but I felt kind of bad because I was trying to follow it. And the only way I had like, uh, one of the anglers wives was like sending me updates, uh, just screenshots from the deal that you couldn't, that wasn't like for the public. And I was like, man, I want to watch this. And then Pastrana did like a Facebook live from it and guys were posting from it. And I started looking and I'm like, you got like 10 to 12 million social media followers between these people and like 2% of them follow Bassmaster and the anglers that they're fishing with. Like that's a big opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I, so did they push it out? Was it anything more than just kind of like on their website? Who won it? No. So, uh, Hoodfish Entertainment and Chris Zaldane won it. Hmm. Chris hooked him up with a net and I guess he went nuts, caught like 15 keepers and then Chris, caught a four pounder right at the end to win it. He won a boat, not Chris, but, uh, but his partner Hoodfish entertainment is what he goes he, by. He, he actually, won a, so the winner got yes, a boat. Yes. It, from Bass Pro Shops, an actual <laughs> like vessel with a motor and rigged out and everything. So yeah. it was a big deal. Uh, and I was like, dude, like this needs to be a thing. Like we need to get, Co Wetzel, Travis Pastrana, and Randy Moss, like across the classic stage. This needs to be pumped up big time before this event. Now, I do know that it was, I don't want to say a last minute, but they, it was not something that they'd worked on. You know, they'd had some stuff, I think, with Academy for the last couple years that they'd worked on and things. So this was with Progressive and Bass Pro Shop. So this was not something that they'd worked on a year in advance. And I do know that a lot of the uh, celebrities took it incredibly seriously. Because, you know, Robinson doesn't want Randy Moss to beat him. And Randy Moss yeah. doesn't want Brian Robinson to beat him. But here's my deal on this, Matt. This is the perfect opportunity to reach exact target audiences that would potentially a portion of them become fans of professional fishing. If this thing is blown out next year, we get them across the stage. Everybody knows in the celebrity pro-am becomes a real thing, especially in, in Fort Worth next year. Like they have the perfect opportunity to reach 10 million people who like things that go fast, jerseys, shiny cars, competition, winning and trophies. Boom. Here it is right here. Celebrity Pro-Am. Make it a thing. Put some money yeah. into it. Hey, dude, uh, any anything to help push the sport out to, uh, you know, not even fans, but to, to viewers that are unfamiliar with the sport is definitely a positive. I mean, I... I don't, so I don't know anything that took place with this event. My assumption, is, my assumption is they didn't do anything at the expo, but if you've got those celebrities, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't even, I would go out and fish whenever. So on the, they must've done it on the day off of the anglers. And mm-hmm. then at that point, well, they did I it with anglers. She didn't make the classic. I wouldn't. Oh, so what day? Oh, they did. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. They did it on Thursday media day. So, so you do it. So do it on the first day of the expo with those anglers. And then you have the weigh-in on the stage. So even if there's only 10 or 15 boats, everyone at that expo would love to see, you know, they're not their favorite. Well, I mean, Scott Martin, they'd probably love to see, but Scott Martin with Travis Pastrana would even be 10 times better. I mean, these are people that the fishing, a lot of people in the fishing industry are familiar with, but they don't ever get the opportunity to see them. So put them, you know, you don't have to put them on the main stage, Put them in the expo. Put it, set a stage up and have them at the expo, or have them come across the the live stream. You know, do something where the fans can come in contact with those people, and it would be ridiculous. I mean, get you got to make it feel like the classic for them. You got it. Yeah. That's what I said when they hand that. You know, you got to get it to where those guys can feel like, oh my gosh, this is what it feels like to win a bass tournament. Yeah, yeah. You get. I mean, and, and think of that. Think of getting some of those celebrities that have those big followings get them all of a sudden they're fishing once or twice a year and just throwing a post up like the rock does i mean the rock puts a post every once in a while and there's more excitement around him because he caught one in a pond in his backyard than there is anytime one of us wins a tournament so i mean that's the type of thing that could bring eyeballs into it you bring the celebrities into our world and you'll get cameras on them and you know if if 
when they had these people there, they should have put them up in the expo stage. They could have had local news out there just to say, hey, so-and-so is here. And it does, again, I'm talking about something I know nothing about, but it sounds like it was a missed opportunity. And that there needs to be live. It needs, it needs to be live. We need to be able to, to log on on yeah. that day before the classic starts, just like we're going to watch it on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and get a camera in each one of these boats. And you know, FS1, FS1 is, and FS2, very receptive to talent, to that. We That needs yeah. to be a live event, even if it's just an hour special. There needs to be, or, or even if it's just a packaged hour special on the Celebrity Pro-Am that then runs on FS1, but there needs to be cameras in the boat with all those people there needs to show the interaction the excitement of oh yeah. my gosh i got one that's how you're going to get more people involved and i'm not talking about this whole grow the sport thing i'm talking about from bassmaster for people to follow bassmaster and more people to follow the anglers this is a perfect opportunity yeah i i, I don't agree and it's and it's another thing at the expo if you had have them fish for two hours or three hours live, bring everything back to the expo and put the, you know, put the celebrities up there with the pro on the stage, weigh in the fish and they both get to talk a little bit. And that's just more reason to get viewers at the expo. Like the more people you get at the expo, the better it is for everybody. I talked with Seth Fighter about this. I talked with Chris Saldane about it. Talked with Jamie Harbert about it. Uh, talked with Brian Robinson about it. They all agree. Great event. Incredibly cool. Yeah. Awesome time with their celebrity partners. Make this a big deal. And so <laughs> so we're at Media Day and uh, Chase Anderson walks by and he's like, hey, what's up? And I just jumped right into it. You've got such a great opportunity here. This needs to be bigger. This needs. And he's just standing there going, dude, I was just trying to say hi. I think in his head. And I was like, this needs to be a thing, blah, blah, blah. So then I see Ronnie and I, I lied into Ronnie about it, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, dude, he's like, this was like we were working on putting this together. This was not something that we knew was going to happen six months ago, a year ago, et cetera. But. So the people at Bass have seen the opportunity. I hope they start on it now to work on it because awesome opportunity for Bass, for the celebrities, etc. There's my piece on no. it. And, no, and Chase I, agreed I, with me, I but I think Chase would have agreed with anything because, like I said, I gave him an earful for a solid minute and a half about it. Not a negative I mean, way, but he, he was very probably got jumped. He probably got jumped by like 50 people a day that were like, you got to do this, you got to do that. And oh, I know. I mean... You know, Matt, he, he probably doesn't even know who you are. He just chalked you up as to another fan that uh, had gripes. That's very true. That's very true. He probably had, I mean, he probably had a security detail right behind him, <laughs> about ready to kick yeah. me out of media day after my, my rant. So what did, so what did you think about the classic? I never asked you like, so overall <laughs> you've been to like every one since you were 12. So where, where did this one rank? Uh, this was a very solid classic. I thought the expo numbers were very solid. I thought it was a very functional expo. I kept saying, dude, it's going to get so crowded in here. You won't be able to move around, but that never happened. I'd be interested to see what bass comes out for the numbers, but it was very well attended. You also have to remember it was the third one uh, that we've had since 2013 in Tulsa. Uh, there's also a demographic of people that go to the lake and don't go to the expo or guys that go to the expo and don't go to the lake or whatever, since it was 90 miles away. So I, I thought the expo was incredibly solid that there was some areas that were harder to find than others, but as a whole, it's a very easy expo to move around. I like the fact that you can walk straight across to the BOK center. Yeah. Uh, Bass has struggled and will always continue to struggle. You know, you got 56 guys in this thing and you never know when your first, your last classic is, and you have to give the guys time on stage. You're Red Crest competitor because you what you know how hard it is to get to championship level tournaments. You have earned that time on stage for your family to talk, to say your piece, to walk across it, to hold your fish up, even if you didn't catch much. That is one of the main reasons why all these guys do this all year for that opportunity. Now you got a four and a half hour weigh in the first couple of days yeah. because of that. So 
you're in a bit of a pickle, Matt. Like, what do you do? Like, seriously, what do you do? Do you have any ideas on how you speed that process up? So you got people that want to go to the first and second day weigh in and not either be drunk or bored halfway through it. I mean, I, I, I would be willing to bet you based on my experience in other championship level events that, you know, the, uh, staff were probably encouraging them to keep, keep, the first day of the event short on the weigh-in stage, knowing that every angler has the ability to weigh in twice. The thing is, it's such a big stage. None of the anglers really want to miss out on that opportunity. And I mean, I'd be willing to bet you every one of them had family and friends that were there to watch them. So you want, you want to get up there and at least speak for a few minutes because you do have people that came from across the country to watch you. And you've earned that right. So from that standpoint, I don't know that they can change a whole lot. Potentially, maybe you cut the field down a few spots. You know, there there's a bunch of people that have been invited in that aren't necessarily qualifying through the elites. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying, like, that's where I would potentially think about cutting spots. But I also know how valuable, like you know, a spot is to get there through the opens. I mean, Adam Rasmussen is a buddy of mine and he almost won the dang thing. Like, I mean, and he qualified through the open. So I don't know that you want to take away from that, but there's definitely, it's a long way. in. Like that's, it's a, I mean, I was at, I was at the expo for two hours while it was going on and then went and basically finished dinner and it was still going on. I mean, it was like, man, I just wanted to see who was doing what at the end of the first day, let alone be there. I, well, I mean, how did you see how good the turnout was the first day in terms of a crowd? So, no, because I knew what it would be like and I didn't go until the final day because for so many years I had to, you know, interview every single yeah. guy who came off the stage. I didn't have that opportunity. I was with uh, Courtney. It was her first classic. I didn't want her. I wanted her to see the final day. And yeah. Uh, the final day was long. It was uh, amazing. Mercer did a fantastic job. It was uh, exciting. Um, yeah. It was still long. You know, they did 19 guys and then they did the super six, but it's also supposed to be a bit of a spectacle. But she did look at me midway through the 19 and say, I'm glad we didn't go to days one and two. Yeah. because it's 56 of those and there's no payoff at the edge. You're not waiting for the super six and the lights to go down and the smoke and them to come out and Mercer to introduce them that the, the goosebumps deal that everybody gets where they're sitting up there watching it. Do they, they need to. So two things on that Mercer is phenomenal. I don't know how he keeps the energy level that he does mm -hmm. and how, like, do you know, does he have that stuff memorized or is that just off the hip? Like, is he just firing? He's, he's fired. Gotta, he just knows that. Well, he also lives with these guys. He's done it for 14 stats, years. Oh, a hundred percent. He knows yeah. those stats. But when he was yelling all the guys stat, they're talking about all the top of the stats. You know, he's a third year lead search person. So top 10. No, I can't all that. And then like Coop Gallant walks out and everything like that's yeah. he's that's just him. Like that's him memorizing that stuff. Yeah. And in the moment, being able to do it that smooth. Yeah, he's he's so good at, at keeping the excitement level because, I mean, honestly, that crowd excitement level, mm -hmm. so much of that comes from him. Like if he lost that, the crowd would lose it. So like that's super valuable. And and then like he's really good at just adjusting. You know, if, if an angler makes a comment or makes a joke, he's able to take that joke and real quickly work that back into like the rest of the of the interview. And it's it's he's really good. The the other comment I'd say about the final day weigh in, I I felt like they lost. They I felt like the excitement level was very quickly diminished because they did not do the, like the fireworks and confetti and all that. So you know they they announced the winner, and Justin kind of walked out there, threw his hands up, and then there was like some walking around. You know there was the trophy <laughs> handoff. Like they why why would you not just make the place go nuts and then do the trophy after that. That was it. That was a takeaway I had where I was like, man, I felt like the excitement level was not there for the win. It's been like that every year. I don't know what it is logistically, but it needs to be. Here's the final two. Here's the winner chaos. Yeah. It needs to be like the confetti. And you know, I, I don't know if they have fireworks anymore. I didn't, they didn't have them at this, but like there needs to be some, 
stuff going off as soon as they say who the winner is. Yeah. Now, I don't know if there's something where they're like double checking to make sure that everything is right. And then maybe in the ear, they're like, all right, it is. It's a done deal. Everything's good to go. Because I don't know what that's like logistically. Because you also have to then have Gussie there to come out. Like there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. Bang, bang, bang. But that I agree. Once it is Justin Hamner, uh, I think obviously they do. They've done a good job of talking to him to where it just worked out this time where you're able to talk to Rasmussen, but like no lull and just thrust him right into the chaos. Yeah. I would personally like to see immediately as soon as he wins, he lifts the classic trophy and they do the lap because every year, and I sit in the top of the dang arena every single year on the final stage or the final day, there's when they do the iconic lap, everyone's already filing out of the thing. And I get yeah. it. It doesn't change your life that Justin Hammer won the classic. You go, oh, cool. And you go on with your life. The people who are the diehard fans stay and watch it. The people who are friends stay and watch it. The family stays and watch it. There's just some people that leave with two minutes left in every single game. But get them in that get them in that lap where it's still chaos and not the half empty arena for the lap. Yeah, I agree. And and again, I, I don't, I'm just watching from a fan perspective there. I don't know what needs to happen behind the scenes. It just seems like they could do, they could do the big celebration first. And then like the trophy handoff could be more of an actual presentation, you know, where you like interview Gussie in this case, and then, you know, have the actual handoff and then have him, whether that's jump in the boat at that point and take a lap or, I mean, heck, I think, I think you have him take a lap around the entire complex, not just like inside, but take him outside, <laughs> take him outside up and down, down the street. The street yeah. Too. Yeah. Cause it was like in that case, you know, with what you were saying that the Tulsa venue, as much as I'm not a huge fan of the expo layout, the way the city lays out in terms of like, you know, there were hotels, expo, arena and they shut down the roads to be able to do stuff in the roads it was like bass took over a several block area for Mm -hmm. the entire event and that just makes it that much easier because people can walk everywhere they need to go they don't need to worry about cars hitting them because there's food trucks blocking one street off there's you know the live set going on in another place and uh you know it was it was a cool event i will say People do not understand how much goes on behind the scenes. We've had uh, Eric Lopez who works behind the scenes, like with the city and all that. And he's talked about some of the nightmare stuff that we never see in front of the stage. But when you're dealing with the live fish and the weigh in and the guys driving 90 miles yeah. and all of the timing as far as uh, sponsor stuff that you have to have in and the TNT fireworks and the, uh, and the DJ and the lighting and I mean all of that stuff yeah. for it to actually run the way it does. We take for granted how good Bass does with it to put the product out that they do. And I'm nitpicking on this stuff uh, just in a, in a perfect world. Like there's a lot of people that are really good at their jobs to make it go off as smooth as it does uh, because it's not a set like you don't know what the guys are going to say how long the guys are going to talk who's going to have a blowout like kyle patrick did on the way back in like there's a bunch of uncontrollable variables in a bass master way yep yep onion like nick said lots of layers onion guys (laughs) yeah Uh, I, i mean we're just sitting here throwing out ideas i mean i'm i'm sure they're valid ideas though I mean, yeah, but in the in the scheme of things, they're not going to change much with respect to it. They're just little nitpicking things that we experienced. I know you got to bounce here in a couple minutes. Uh, do you have any of the new core tackle stuff sitting right there that you had at the classic? If you don't, you don't. It's no big deal. I should have should have queued you up on that. Do you have that little yeah, thing that that screws in to the hook? And then, uh. Also, the swim jig is pretty legit, I feel like. I think I got some laying around. Yes, we are 100% armchair quarterback in Jacob. I mean, we so we we had – you want the wacky rig. I don't have – 
You have worry. that thing with the hook with the weight on the hook with the little screw. Yeah, that's, so that's our wacky shot. You should have queued me up earlier. Dude. I know it's poor planning on my part. This is Bush League. It really is. What's the name of that? Because we're just calling it the wacky thing. I'm trying to find. All I have are prototype ones laying around. Oh. Hold on. Here's one. Nice. This is an unpainted one. They come uh they come in black is the only color, but so that's our wacky shot hook. So it's a finesse wide gap hook. <laughs> I don't know why it's so hard. And then I had a uh, custom enlarged hitchhiker mounted below it to mount your wacky rig into it if you want, or if yeah. you're going to use the new cue ball from G crack, which is where it's getting a lot of, uh, a lot of attention, but you basically just mount it, uh, your wacky rig right in the center, just like you would with an O ring. The difference is, so this is actually a Japanese technique again, that we're trying to bring to the U S cause it's been awesome. So when you lower the weight down to the point where it touches the worm, it slightly increases your fall rate, increasing the vibration of your wacky rig arms. So in this case, this is a 128 ounce weight. We've got an eighth ounce as well. Uh, we're also going to be doing these on NACO style hooks. So for those of you that like a bigger hook, we're going to have that too. Um, but a little cool little piece, like I said, they're all black. This one is the unpainted lead. I don't know why so you're we so that. fuzzy sometimes. Sometimes you're a, a tad fuzzy. I don't know why. And then it'll go super clear and then you're fuzzy. Like if you don't like don't move at all, like don't move anything, like look at the camera and don't move in a non the non creepiest way possible see you're clear and then you start moving and then it gets fuzzy i don't know why it's always like that with you probably shitty i'm sorry crummy wi-fi we've got a little finesse this is our finesse tush so that's our swim bait hook it's mm -hmm. made on a light wire two watt hook we got eighth ounce three sixteenth quarter ounce this is a little killer this is actually the the same hook that was in the Dirty Jigs Guppy head, only instead of it being a 90, it's a 60. So if you're familiar okay. with that, that's the hook. Uh, we had a couple new sizes of Ozark rigs come out, a couple of new sizes. We had a heavy-duty hover rig, so a 6 odd quarter ounce come out. Uh, Do you yeah, have the swim jig? Oh, yeah. And the swim jig. What did I, just I, was, I, was, I thought that was super cool. Here, I do have some swim jigs. These will be hitting the website coming soon. So we've got, well, they're still in the bags, but this okay. is our shad color. We got Goldilocks, which is my all-time favorite color. Trying not to move for you, Matt, so it can center. Yeah, up. no, it looks great. Uh, Bluegill, which is my other favorite color. So they these are all... These are all uh, colors. We got five colors, but we they're all colors that I hand tied for the past 20 years. So I had those specifically made to my specifications. Everyone's got just a little bit of Flashaboo mixed in. So that's a little different. Plus, we've got uh, a, a light wire weed guard instead of your standard bristle weed guard, which is something that I really like. See if you can see that. So it's just a light wire weed guard. We've got it in a four aught, three eighth ounce. The other key with this, by the way, too, is it's built off of our tush. Let me get that back. So the weight good. is down the shank of the hook, which yeah, so it's, you've it's got a the swim same jig. form yeah. as, as that tush swim bait hook. But in this case, you know, again, what you're doing is you're transferring weight to the back of the bait. So if you put like a boot tail on this, you get way better side to side rotation than any other swim jig I've ever seen. Uh, plus your trailer stays locked in place with no problem. And then at the same time, you tend to lose less fish. Well, you get better hookups because now the, instead of having a bigger head, we've just got a small, tiny little head just to mount the weed guard. And then because the majority of your weight is transferred back to your hook penetration point in the fish, when they go to jump, they lose that leverage of having a bigger swim bait head further away. In this case, all your weight's closer to that penetration point. So you don't lose them when you stick them. Uh, but we've got that. And then one of the sizes, we've got a four-aught quarter ounce, a four-aught three 
eighth ounce and a two watt quarter ounce. So it's a tiny little guy. You put like a little 2.8 uh, swim bait on it and you can, you can really have a small micro little swim jig that does a good job of uh, just giving the fish a different look. If you're in an area where you like to throw just your little 2.8s or 3.3s. Those, those will be on the website in uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. The swim jigs, everything else is up, I believe, except for the wacky rig. But those are at Tackle Warehouse right now. Anything else before I let you go? I don't know where you have to go, but I promise you I'd get you out of here by 10. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the uh, the sponsor ability to sponsor plug there with Core Tackle. Just well, it wasn't like, more uh, of a sponsor plug. I think it's cool because we have Johnny on the show a lot. We have you on the show a lot. You guys are kind of the co-founders of Core Tackle, and it just started with with the, what, the one hover rig? Hover rig, yeah. And yeah. I remember, you know, oh, we got this thing. Oh, we can't talk about it. I think we're going to start selling it. Oh, we're selling it. Oh, my gosh, it's selling. And I feel like I'm kind of invested as you guys have, have grown and uh, expanded and become more and more popular. Now you go in just about any tackle store. You know, I was in, uh, I was in Lucky Lure the other day, and boom, right. I mean, literally, right on the front, right there, they have the core tackle. With most of your stuff was sold out in there already, but it's really cool to to see that and kind of follow it as it has grown and expanded. It's been a wild ride, one that I'm very, very appreciative of all the support that we've had, and uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, continuing to, to make more stuff <laughs> how not prior johnny has been yeah. working out pretty hardcore for the last like six months and he has gotten kind of jacked i was i was impressed like johnny looked looked like he could hold his own he used to be a little pencil and now he's actually like i mean he's been doing the whole crossfit thing and working out hard i need i need to start doing that myself i've i've still got my winter weight when are you back on the water, Matt? We go to Dale Hollow. I leave uh, next uh, next Friday or Saturday. Oh, so I think it's like the one April, I'm looking April, forward to. April 9th, I think, is the start of the tournament, maybe. I think that is the one that I'm looking forward to most on the BPT schedule. That Dale Hollow tournament was a great, uh, great addition to the schedule. It's going to be monster weights. Like that, I've never been there, but everyone keeps telling me it's going to be lots of hundred pound days for us. There are lots of three to four pound largemouth and smallmouth, and the fact that we're able to catch way release the smallmouth versus other tournaments that have to deal with a big slot limit uh, is going to open it up even more. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so am I. I mean, there's been a, I think there was a Toyota there last year, or the year before, and there's kind of, I think, been some other tournaments, but as far as a major national tournament with TV coverage where you can watch it on such a famed fishery, the BPT stop on Dale Hollow is 1A for me in the 2024 season. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Well, it was good seeing you at the Classic. Thanks for coming on and breaking down uh, a number of different aspects. I think we're kind of wrapping up the... Well, no, we still have Frank Scalish tonight at 6.30, but that should kind of wrap up the two weeks of Classic coverage surrounding Grand Lake. I don't think I missed any angles. Maybe I did. Maybe not. I don't know. Dude, like you, I need a, you need a vacation. Uh, well, I'm going to California for Easter. And on Friday, because uh, that's where... Uh, Courtney's family's from so on Friday I did I uh, did guide day last week with uh, Captain Ben Florentino uh, who's one of the legendary saltwater bass so calico bass uh, guides and tournament anglers out there he's like oh you know he says says it but he, I also know Matt Florentino because he works for AFCO okay like, oh, when you get out here you need to get on the water so I saw Matt at the classic and i was like yeah i'll be out there for four or five days he's like really so he texts his dad and friday we're going out to catalina island like the catalina island and we're going calico bass fishing so i'm beyond nice. jacked for that yeah that'll be fun where what part of california southern california like right around that laguna laguna area orange oh, county boy. oh boy well yeah. that'll be interesting you think you're gonna be able to fit in down there I've been down there like two, three times before. Absolutely. Oh, you're really, you're going hardcore meeting the family, huh? 
I've already met him a bunch. Yeah. Wow. Getting serious. Yeah. No, it's Eddie. super laid back. It's like one of my favorite parts of the country. Just it's really expensive. Like everything is like really expensive. So if but you, other if than you that, see, it's fantastic. If you see LC from Laguna Beach, tell her I say hi. She, she's I on forgot the we're this we're the same age. We were big. <laughs> like I said, like I, I watched that. I was like a freshman at OU watching all that stuff. The hill, yeah. were you a Laguna Beach or a Hills fan? Uh I mean both. They they went hand in hand, right? That was yeah. one reason I was kind of disappointed Jay Cutler broke up with uh Kristen, Kristen? Cavallari. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> I got some stories. I'll call I'll, I'll uh I'll give you a call after the show. So sounds good. I got it's all go. good. I appreciate it, dude. Thanks, man. See you guys. Good luck at Dale Hollow. Thank you. See ya. All right. That was Matt Stefan. Uh that'll wrap things up for today's edition of BTL tonight. If you're watching this live, March 27, 6 30 p.m., which is a Wednesday, day four with the man Frank Scalish, basszone.com. Click on the tab, shop BTL merch store open through April 8th. Uh, I am six foot and 180 pounds, and the large fits me in the t shirt and the sweatshirt. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see everybody tonight. Later. <laughs>